Lord Jesus, as we worship you, Lord, and see the vision that John saw as you revealed to him what we read about in Revelation. Our hearts stir within us, Lord God. Our minds are transported to another place, a reality, Lord, that awaits us. And yet, Lord, we don't have to wait until we see all those beautiful promises and see our faith made sight because we can enter into the Holy of Holies now. And God, we thank you that you welcome us into your presence. You long for us to be in, in your presence as we are your children and you love us with an everlasting love. Lord, you are holy. You are righteous. You are perfect in every way. And we thank you, God, for drawing us close to you today to worship, to bow before your, your throne in the Holy of Holies. Now, Lord, as we turn our hearts and our minds to your word, we pray, Lord, you will continue to speak to us and that we would hear words of life, words of freedom, and that we would regain the right perspective of your holiness. in the way that you work in our lives. We thank you, Lord. Bless this time, we pray. May it honor you through Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Welcome. We are glad to have you. We are glad that everyone has uh, tuned in. We're doing a dress rehearsal today. And we are going to see how it goes. So far, so good, I think. I've not gotten any panicky texts that uh, things aren't going so well. And I see a, a chat there, Bob. I'm, I'm sure you're keeping up with the chat. So thank you for that. Um, we're in Acts chapter 9 today, continuing our study in Acts 9. And as you're turning there, I want to talk about needlepoints. This is not uh, the Zoom class for needlepoint training. Don't worry, you're, you're in the right place. But I want to talk about needlepoint. Now, I would venture to say that only a handful of y'all, maybe even one or two of you, have ever even attempted needlepoint. But the interesting thing to me about needlepoint is that it looks so beautiful on the top side. And it looks like a mess on the underside. And our lives, really, in Christ especially, are just like that. We are walking through this journey of life and God is doing something and creating something and weaving something beautiful in each of us and in our world. But from our perspective, looking up at the tapestry, it doesn't look so pretty. We see the strings, we see the mess, we see the knots, we see those things that we see a vague picture of what it may end up being, but we don't have God's perspective. This is something we question God. We, it challenges our faith many times when we find ourselves wondering, pondering what God is doing. Why am I feeling sick? Why am I in this financial crisis that I'm in right now? What is going on in my world? What's happening? The early church from the very beginning ran into so much of these questions. The same ones we find ourselves asking today. The Lord would allow them to undergo great persecution and suffering, even in the fledgling days. But we'll see today that it ended up resulting in the uh, multiplication 
is the word that we see today, of the church. Many people getting saved, great revival sweeping through. God uses those things that we consider unnecessary problems, untimely detours, unplanned pain, because he's doing something deeper in us and in our world. And it's a challenge for the faith of each one of us as we grow in him to say, okay, God, just like Job did, I have heard of you with the hearing of my ear, but now my eye sees you. Job was convinced that he was right, and he defended himself, and he wanted to talk to God and ask him these questions as to why this was going on. And all of a sudden, his why turned into a who. He got his perspective right. He saw God with his real eyes, the eyes of his heart. And he realized who God is. And he said, I repent in dust and ashes. And so we, as we grow in the Lord, can take a good lesson from him. That God knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing in our world. He knows what he's doing in our lives. In Acts 9, we've been looking at Paul and his conversion when he was still Saul. He thought he was going to arrest, imprison, even uh, give a sentence of capital punishment to these early Christians, followers of the way. And he's on his way to Damascus as a great persecutor. But instead of going in proud and in, in control and powerful, he instead went in humbled, blind, being led by the hand like a little child. And he spent three days in that blindness. And then the scales fell off his eyes and the scales falling off his eyes, much like a picture of the scales of his religion and his religious and his pride, self-righteousness falling away. And in his humility, he came to the Lord, a new man. And today we pick it up in verse 20. It says, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, he is the son of God. This Jesus that he was arresting people for following, now he's saying he is the son of God. And immediately, says, for now for several days he was with the disciples, verse 19, who were at Damascus. And he was with them. We'll see, they were at first very afraid of him. But immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, heresy that these Jewish leaders were hearing, but he was saying he is the son of God. But look at the next verse. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed, and the word there is mauled, those who called on this name, Jesus, and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priest, but Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. He knew his Bible. He was very learned. He couldn't have had his position as a religious leader, a member of the Sanhedrin, had he not known his Bible. He had many, many verses of the Torah memorized. In this three days of darkness that he was in, I believe God was discipling him very quickly to help him connect the dots between the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus and this person who came on the scene, who now he is realizing has met him face to face, has called him by name, Saul. Saul, he said, with compassion, pain in his voice, deep emotion. Why are you persecuting me? I can just imagine how much his heart sank at that point and the conviction that he had knowing that he had been a vessel of wickedness, of darkness, of evil, and now coming to the Lord, coming to the light and the scales falling off 
the light in his heart has been shining for a few days and now the light in his eyes has returned. And immediately he starts proclaiming Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the son of God after all. Let me tell you, and let me take you back to your Bible, he tells the Jews. Let me show you this Jesus, this Messiah, and why he is the one. They, could, they were confounded by him. He was confounding them. He was, they were perplexed. They, were, they couldn't argue, in other words, with what he was teaching them. Between verses 22 and verse 23, something happens in Saul's life. It says, and when many days had elapsed. Well, that many days is many more days than you may think. Let's hold our place in Acts chapter 9. And go over to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Because we see here Paul telling the church of Galatia some information about what we are reading. A little background between verses 22 and 23 right here in Galatians 1. Let's pick it up in verse 11. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which, I, which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. And when he had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. And then he also says, I did not see any other apostles except James, the, the Lord's brother. He's writing to, to them to help him under, them understand that he had some discipleship. And what I want you to see there, I want us all to see, is that he was right out of the gate, very convincing, knowing and drawing from his knowledge of the word and saying, this Jesus is the Messiah. And yet the Lord then led him to go to the wilderness for three years. Three years. What's going on? I thought it was urgent. I thought it was, would be very important and necessary that he get busy Telling people more about Jesus. He, right out of the gate, right there, it says immediately he was confounding them. He could have kept confounding them for those three years. It seems like wasted three years. It seems like time that he could have better invested preaching and convincing the Jews and leading so many to Christ. But God put him in the seminary of the wilderness. Took him away for those many years to disciple him. In fact, we learn elsewhere that he went to Sinai in the wilderness of Arabia. And some have said Sinai is elsewhere, but this tells us that Sinai is in Saudi Arabia. And that's where he went, Midian, where we'll find Sinai. So he goes away alone, led by the Lord to learn from God to meditate on his word, to continue again in the seminary of the wilderness to learn more of this savior of his just like job he had known him of the hearing of the the ear the knowledge of the mind but now his eye sees him in his heart he knows him more deeply than he has before and so he's going to come back ready to serve and maybe he didn't understand it at the time maybe he didn't understand why he was being delayed for so many years but God was preparing him not only to confound the Jews and to give a great defense of the gospel, but also to be able to face the great persecution that he was going to face over and over again from stonings to 
near death and many times even dying and coming back. So when many days had elapsed, back to verse 23, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. So he comes back after these many days, and they're going to want to do away with him, to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. And we don't know if that was somebody who told him or if the Lord revealed it to him. And they were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. And so there he is, coming back, ready to evangelize again, maybe remembering some of these wonderful experiences of confounding them and really teaching them and seeing people come to faith, perhaps. And he goes off to the wilderness for three years, comes back, expecting great things, and he's got death threats. And the man who was going to be leading captives out of Damascus to go back to Jerusalem to stand trial, perhaps, is now being lowered, even humiliated by being lowered to in, in a large basket, much more humbly than he thought. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples. He longed to have fellowship with these other believers. I believe it was in his heart to have fellowship with them. And they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. So the church of Jerusalem, they didn't have Facebook. They they couldn't text ahead and then tell him, hey, uh, by the way, Saul's a Christian now. But he shows up on the scene and like, wait, this is the same guy who was a great persecutor of early believers. And they were very afraid of him. Thinking that he was a spy. And that's happened throughout church history, especially in the early days and still happens today. People will go in feigning conversion or feigning to be a follower of Christ, and they will go in as moles and try to infiltrate churches, especially underground churches. I'm sure that's what they suspected of him. But Barnabas, I love that. So he's going, he's wanting to associate with the disciples. They're afraid of him. But then Barnabas, Barnabas, which his name means the son of encouragement, took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had talked to him, and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas intercedes for him. He can't really speak for himself, but Barnabas has seen the change in him. He's heard the testimony. He's seen the witness. He's heard Saul's heart. He's probably seen the tears that have come from Saul. This is a real change. You know, we can brag on ourselves all we want and tell what a great Christian we are. (laughs) But when someone else speaks of your relationship with God, that speaks more powerfully. And that's what it did here for Barnabas. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. I love that. He went from being feared to now moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to, per, uh, to put him to death. Once again, he's running into to conflict and persecution and danger. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. So throughout, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It continued to increase, or in some version it says it multiplied. So in spite of all the persecution seen in the previous chapters, in spite of uh, Saul being sent away to his hometown of Tarsus, the church continues to be built up, going on in the fear of the Lord, rather than the fear of people. Notice that. Continuing to grow in the fear of the Lord, not in the fear of man. Being built up and enjoying peace and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The comfort of the Holy Spirit. The fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. When we are going through our journey with the Lord, many times our lives look like the long strings, the knots, the garbled mess, and we doesn't make sense. I thought this was a beautiful thing you were doing in my life, Lord. I thought something good was happening here. What's going on? We got to understand that we are growing in two things the fear of the Lord, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Each of these is needed in each of our lives 
in our relationship with Christ. At any given moment, a disciple of the Lord of the Lord may more need the fear of the Lord or the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Depending on where we are right now today, some of us need more of the fear of the Lord to draw us back to his heart, to do away with sin. Some of us have been going through a lot of pain and suffering and loss and grief, and we need the comfort of the Holy Spirit, depending on where we are in our walk right now. Often God wants the comfortable to be afflicted. And he arranges our lives so that we who have found ourselves just very comfortable and just kind of cruising along in our nice little uh, churchianity and, and going along in life and everything's happy and rosy. And if something bad happens, you know, well, it'll, it'll be over soon. But maybe sometimes the Lord brings affliction to the comfortable. Why? So we will gain the fear of the Lord. So that we will gain the fear of the Lord. And just as John, in that beautiful rendition of the Revelation, was on his face before God, that's a good place for us to find ourselves, on our face before God. Other times, the afflicted need to be comforted. And it says here, by the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we're afflicted with emotional pain, physical pain, and we need the comfort of the Holy Spirit. I love that verse. The fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes God will comfort the afflicted. Sometimes he will afflict the comforted. And he'll do that so, as, so he can bring about this wonderful result in our hearts and in our lives. The fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And what that results in, the church multiplies. When the world sees us, the body of Christ, going through stuff, with grace and with faith and with patience and with peace and the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the world notices and the church multiplies. Perhaps what God is doing even during this season is bringing the church worldwide to that place where we will be a light in darkness. We'll be salt among those who are so desperate for life. And we will be able to share with them just through our lives, they will see that we are not afraid, that we're trusting in the Lord. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. <laughs> and, and they think, how can you have such confidence? How can you have such boldness? How can you be so sure? Well, you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. And he wants to live within your heart. He came to save you. He came he, to die in your place, to be the satisfaction of the wrath of God on sin. He took that so that you could live. The church continued to be multiplied. A beautiful thing. So it wasn't only in Saul's life that he was seeing the underside of the tapestry. It also happened in a couple other people, and we'll look at the second half of this section, picking it up in verse 32. Now it came about that as Peter was traveling through all those parts, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. That's the first place we see the reference to uh, the body of Christ, to Christians as saints, holy ones. Now, again, that's the ones who are set apart. Doesn't mean holier than thou ones, but ones who are set apart. It does not mean we're, we're, um, we're not perfect in the fact practically. We've not been made perfect in our practical existence yet. Amen to that. We all can relate, even this morning, I'm sure, with the flesh that battles against the spirit within each of us. But it does mean we're set apart. We are different. We, um, we are known by our love and we're known by the way that we handle things. And it came about, as Peter was traveling through all those parts, he came also to the saints who lived at Lydda. And this is over close to the coast of the Mediterranean. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years, for he was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ has healed you. Arise and make your bed. And immediately he arose. And all who lived at Lydda and Sharon, or Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. So we see here a man who has been bedridden for eight years. Not seven years, not nine years, because the timing in God's providence is lining up with Peter coming to town and the Lord is going to 
do an amazing work in this man's physical body so that he can bring spiritual revival and new life to all the people around who heard about it. All who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord, all. Now the word there in verse 35, all, you have a pen, make a note of that. Circle that word all, that means right to the side, all. <laughs> that means all, all means all. All those who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. Verse 34, and Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you is what it says in the text. What it means there, has healed you. Because of what Jesus has done, he has healed you. He's healed you. Now, we understand that God heals. In this case, God did an amazing work of healing. And he still heals today. But does he heal every time? No. Many times the Lord allows us to continue in our suffering. Many times he allows us to do something and to go through something so that he can do a deeper work in our hearts and in our lives. Our part is to trust him, to draw close to him, to know that he is doing something in us. And in this case, in the world around this man who'd been paralyzed for eight years. It's interesting to me, again, the timing of this whole thing. God knew this man was going to be healed. God knew that Peter was going to be the vessel used by God. Notice it doesn't say Peter healed him. It says Jesus Christ heals you. The same Jesus Christ that Peter had watched do amazing things is the same Jesus Christ that was now living in Peter and doing, still doing amazing things through him. The same Jesus Christ that lives within us. He said, Jesus Christ has healed you. But I wonder about this man's life up to this point. We don't know much more about him. I wonder how often he had struggled with this paralytic condition. Not how long he had had it, but how long he had struggled with it. How long he had wrestled with God about it. How long he had questioned and envied and coveted those who could walk. And he had seen the underside of the tapestry. Maybe he was even depressed. Bedridden, eight years, for he was paralyzed. And Peter comes. And Jesus heals him so that, not only so that he could walk, but so that a deeper work could be done in the whole town and all those around him. Many times God takes us through stuff so that a deeper work can be done, not only in us, but as a witness for those around us. We tell our testimony, we tell our story of how God did a work in my heart. I was healed over time, I was, uh, or I got worse before I got better, or medically I got better. Either way, our story must always come to Jesus. It always has to, because that is why we are here. That's why he's allowed us to be afflicted for a season, so that we would be comforted and comfort those who are afflicted, so that we can share with those. And have a deeper walk with Jesus. And that many turn to the Lord, like we see in verse 35. Now in Joppa, we'll finally see one other miracle and wrap it up. Now in Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated in Greek, Dorcas. Now Tabitha means gazelle, and in Greek it means gazelle. <laughs> Dorcas means gazelle. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. And it came about at that time that she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her body, they laid it in an upper room. So standard operating procedure that they would wash the body ceremonially and they would uh, bind the hands and, and so forth and, and wrap them in cloths and put them in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent to 
men to him, entreating him, do not delay to come to us. When did they call for Peter to come? After she had died. So they believed in resurrection. And Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him into the upper room and all the windows Widows, pardon me, stood beside him weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. Interesting. She made something akin to tapestries, didn't she? But Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up and calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it came known, became known to all, all over Joppa. And there it is again, many believed in the Lord. Tabitha was a very well-known, well-respected, deeply loved woman of God. And she made these beautiful tapestries, and she was so kind. And it's verse 36. Her, she was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity. Oh, that that would be spoken of each one of us, that we would be abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. She knew the secret to happiness was to give and to serve and to be a blessing to the people around us. That's the key to happiness. That's, the, that's the, the secret. If you're looking for the secret, the joy in your life, the secret is through serving, through blessing, being kind, being loving. And it came about at that time that she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her body, they laid in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, entreating him, do not delay to come to us. And Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him into the upper room. And all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics that Dorcas had made. Peter sent them all out to make a note and knelt down and he prayed. He knew where the strength was coming from. He knew where the power was. He knew that greatness starts with humility. And so he kneels and he prays. Sometimes you may find yourself praying, driving down the road. That's fine. Just don't close your eyes. <laughs> you may find yourself uh, lying in bed at night praying, waking up in the morning praying, going on a prayer walk. But there's something special when we kneel to pray before the Lord. There's no real orthodox way. Many times we see in the, in, throughout the word, people standing with uplifted hands, praying to the Lord. On their face, totally prostrate on the ground, praying. The Bible says we're to pray continually. We obviously can't have that position while we're praying, flat on the ground. It's as we live our lives and we breathe things up to the Lord, as they come across our path, as we have the opportunity to surrender something to him, to intercede for someone, when God brings someone to our minds to pray for them. Peter knelt down and he prayed. And he said, Tabitha, arise. And I just feel like God gave him, during that time of prayer, the green light. I don't believe it was about Peter's faith. It was about his God. Too much emphasis is placed on someone's faith. Not enough emphasis is placed on our God and our Lord and his limitless power. And so Peter has spent some time at the feet of the Lord. And then he feels like he gets the, the, uh, the okay, the nod from God to go ahead and to release that faith. Tabitha, arise. Interesting, when, when Jesus prayed for that little girl, Jairus' daughter, to be risen from the dead, he said, Talitha, kum. Here, Peter says, Tabitha, kum. Talitha is little girl, arise. And he says, Tabitha, arise. I'm sure Peter saw the connection remembering the Lord and his power, that little girl, 
coming back to life. Again, I want to look at the timing of this. Why did she fall sick when she did? Why did she die when she did? I believe it was so that what we see in verse 42 could happen. Many believed in the Lord. Well, yeah, but does that really happen today? I mean, we really don't see it much today. True. We don't see it much today. But if you've been overseas or if you read testimonies of those who are overseas, the church of God, universal, worldwide, in nations where they don't have any other choice but to trust in God. They may be remote. They may be not have access to medicines or whatever it may be. And faith is exercised. Gospel for Asia, KP Johannan's ministry uh, that we love and, and support. They have a very heavy emphasis on meeting people's physical needs, whether it be through food, clothing, shelter, mosquito nets, whatever it is. But they do all that so that they can get to the hearts and so the hearts will be open to receiving the gospel. And he has spoken about times that uh, he's seen on, in the field and at least heard through the, the uh, preachers that are supported by Gospel for Asia of people dying and coming back to life. It is happening today. It does happen today. The question then begs, why doesn't God always do it? When someone dies, when we pray for them to come back, why don't they? What's God doing? Well, that just speaks to God's unknowable ways. His ways are past finding out. You think about later, Peter is going to be killed, crucified upside down. James is mentioned over in Galatians that we saw, going to be killed. They, they weren't brought back to life. Why? It seems like Peter and James would have been more important to the growth of the church. It seems like, why, why did God seem, want to bring back this woman who was so kind and so loving, yet wasn't really a great evangelist? I mean, what about the impact that they could make? Why didn't they stick around longer? What about Paul? Lost his head. After many years of ministry, especially many years of writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit from his prison cell, these many letters in the Bible. We don't know, but God does. We also don't know what Tabitha continued to do in her life, what kind of impact she continued to have. It wasn't just the many who believed in the Lord in verse 42. Surely her life became such a bold witness, knowing that she had been to the other side. And you, you, you know, let me speak to this too. Some speak of when someone dies and is brought back that they're resurrected. They're not resurrected. Jesus was resurrected because Tabitha was going to die again and she will await her resurrection body. She was brought back to life, but she was not resurrected. Resurrection is reserved for those of us in Christ who will follow the first fruits of our resurrection, Jesus. We will get new bodies that will never die, never get sick, never have pain. They're new bodies to be with the Lord in the new heaven and the new earth. But Tabitha, she came back. Some speak of when someone's brought back, whether it be Tabitha or Jairus' daughter, that, or even Lazarus, that they went into soul sleep. Their soul just kind of tuned out and then they came back and they were with us again. No, that's not biblical at all. The Bible says to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Tabitha went to heaven. And so you would expect when she came back to kind of knock Peter upside the head and say, <laughs> I was having an amazing time with the Lord. What are you doing? But we don't have any record of that. Perhaps the Lord erased that memory. We don't know. But she came back. I suspect that she told stories of heaven and the beauty that she saw there. And again, we don't know the kind of witness, the kind of life, the kind of lives that she impacted after spending a few moments in glory, leaving time and going into eternity and then coming back to time. What an amazing experience she must have had. 
But I feel like those around Tabitha, we see them grieving and weeping loudly, it says, showing the things that she had woven and sewn. They were broken. So they didn't see the whole picture. They didn't have the right perspective. If they only knew what God was about to do. And that's really where I find us today. With the text that we see, Saul going through so much grief. Aeneas suffering for so long. Yet now, I have a feeling he didn't regret those eight years because he got to experience a miraculous touch. And this isn't just that he could walk again. After eight years of paralysis, he has atrophy in every possible imaginable part of his legs and other parts of his body as well. He, hasn't, he doesn't have coordination. He got up and he walked, just like we see Jesus healing paralytics. And they had not only physical strength, muscles created where there were none. It atrophied to a point of inability to walk, not strong enough, but also the knowledge and knowing how to walk again. No physical therapy needed right away. It was a work of creation. I doubt he was regretting those many years because now he's experienced the touch to his body that he'd never known before and resurrection in his spirit that he had never known before. We find ourselves going through a season in our world. And maybe some of us today are finding ourselves going through a season in our bodies, pain, suffering. The question for us is, are we going to allow ourselves to be burdened because we're looking up and just seeing the underside, the dark underbelly? <laughs> of our situation? Or are we gonna get on our knees and pray and say, Lord, show me your perspective and the beauty that you're doing. And Lord, if I can't see it now, Lord, increase my faith that I would trust you and draw closer to you instead of being pushed farther from you. That's the challenge for each one of us. Whenever we go through pain and suffering, anger, anxiety, depression, a lot of those emotions are very familiar, especially in the past two months in our world right now, especially anxiety. If you find yourself anxious, you find yourself fearful, go to the Lord, surrender that to him, confess it to him and tell him, God, I've not been trusting you with this thing. I've had some anger. I'm even questioning why you're allowing this. God, forgive me. And Lord, allow me to see that you know what you're doing. You're in control. And ask the Lord, again, whether you have perspective or not, to change your heart. And he will. Let's not wait until we come out of a season of crisis for God to do a work in us. I believe with all my heart that so much of what God is doing in our world today is renewal in his children. In Chronicles, it teaches us in chapter 7, it says, If my people, who are called by my name, Christian, will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, seek my face, I will heal their land. Whatever land we find ourselves in right now, our job is to take care of our relationship with God. God is preparing his church, his bride, 
to be used by him in the world. I believe God is going to spark a revival in our world, the third great awakening, if you will. And I believe it's beginning with us. Are you praying? Are you surrendering the stuff of this world, the busyness? God has given us a pause, a reset button, the opportunity, the privilege of getting recentered in Him so that we would intercede. It starts with us, the body of Christ. And as God moves on us, the way he moved on Aeneas, the way he moved in Saul, the way he moved in Tabitha, as he moves in us, and we have revival in our hearts, the world around us will be impacted. That's my prayer for each one of us. That we would go to the Lord, kneel before him, and surrender to him and his will for our lives. Clean house. Invite him to search out our hearts, to confess to him sin, to turn away from it, and allow him to bring revival in our lives and in our world. With that in mind, let's go to him now and pray. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your holy word. And we know, Lord God, that you are working in our hearts. And you're working in our hearts because there's work to be done. And Lord, we have become as your children all over the world, especially in America. So busy, so distracted, so materialistic, so preoccupied with stuff. We've forgotten you. Oh, Lord, we, we serve you we we give our talents to you our offerings to you we give our time lord but we also have our gods our idols that have taken root and taken a place your rightful place in our hearts maybe it's our reputation maybe it's our bank account maybe it's our own pride maybe it's our pleasure lord forgive us today Lord, forgive us today. Search our hearts. Show us our wicked ways, and that we would turn from our wicked ways and turn back to you, God. You are a gracious God. You are not mad at us. You are mad about us, deeply in love with us. And you are ready, and you are willing, and you are waiting for us to come to you, just as we are. So right now, just offer that prayer up to the Lord. Confess to him whatever's on your mind. What's on your heart? What is he pointing out to you today that you need to surrender? It may not be a sin. It may be something that is a good thing, but it's taken the place of your relationship with him. Lord, accept our sacrifice. We lay it at your feet. Lord, bring revival in us, your children. Bring revival, Lord, in the world, that the world would see Jesus. And Lord, again, we want to say thank you that you have placed us in this world in the twenty first century in the year 2020 for such a time as this it could be that we are the generation who will see the greatest revival the world has ever known lord let it begin in our own hearts through jesus we pray amen 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 amen